Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our weekly philosophical talks with Stephen Friedman. So first of all, we would like to thank uh, Stephen for being with us weekly. And Stephen Friedman is the New York Times claimed great philosopher, an artist, a scientist, and also a great speaker of ours. And also, before we jump into our talks, we would like to congratulate Stephen with his birthday. And also, it is the Thanksgiving Day. So happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And also, big thanks to the U.S. Consulate General here in Almaty, American Space Almaty, and also you, the audience, for being with us weekly. Please make sure to ask your questions, to give your comments, and let's congratulate Stephen again with his birthday, with this Thanksgiving. And yes, enjoy. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much, Aliyah, for that introduction and for the, the, the good wishes. I really appreciate it. Um, yes, it is Thanksgiving here. Um, it is also my birthday here. We'll be talking about that a little bit because it all comes together this year on the feast day of St. Catherine of Alexandria. And we'll, we'll be talking about that in some detail. First, though, um, in addition to thanking Aaliyah for the introduction and for her continued facilitation of these talks as, as moderator and as as, as a helpful organizer you know, of what we're doing here. Um, I also want to thank the American Consul in El Mahdi. I want to thank Dana, Elmira, everyone involved in making this platform available to me for bringing philosophical perspectives to you. Um, the issues I try to address are those of broad significance or ones that even if on the surface they seem to be narrowly focused, in fact, are broadly relevant. Um, many of the topics are inspired by international days of celebration. Um, this particular day is, this particular talk actually has three main figures and issues of focus. Um, one is St. Catherine of Alexandria, the patron saint of philosophers. Uh, the other is Harry Potter, um, the original movie of which appeared 20 years ago this month. And um, the third is the Gettysburg Address, um, which also has its anniversary in November. Well, first, St. Catherine. Um, as I mentioned, she is the patron saint of philosophers honored throughout really the entire Christian world, especially within the Catholic and the Catholic tradition of Christianity in the West and the Eastern Orthodox tradition of Christianity in the East. It turns out that her her status is especially elevated in the Eastern Orthodox Church, where I've, I've read that she's recognized, again, in, in many denominations as one of the six most important figures in all of Christianity. In, in the West, she is celebrated as one of the 14 holy martyrs one of the most important figures that people in distress call to for assistance in their lives. Now, last week I talked about the books of Joshua in relation to World Philosophy Day. Um, and World Philosophy Day is you know, of special significance clearly um, on the philosophy calendar. Um, the feast day of St. Catherine, though, for me, is of preeminent significance. And there's a section, a, a verse, a paragraph from Joshua that is directed towards St. Catherine and actually addresses the moment, the occasion, when I discovered that she was, in fact, the patron saint and that her feast day was in fact November 25th, which happens to be my birthday. So I wanted to begin by reciting that and then um, maybe telling the story 
um, in a little more detail as to how that came about, that discovery came about. Um, then we'll go into some aspects of her life, her significance um, philosophically, why she emerged as the patron saint, um, what that implies, uh, and, and we'll go from there. I want to talk a little bit about her representation in the history of art. Um, she is such a central figure um, in the Christian tradition that she's been the subject of innumerable works by great masters of the Western tradition and the Eastern tradition of painting. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between philosophy and religion, since um, she represents the convergence of those two. Okay, um, and then we'll go into a little bit about Harry Potter, um, a little bit about the Gettysburg Address, but the main focus of the talk is actually going to be on St. Catherine. And then at the end, as always, I'll answer questions. We had a, a lot of questions from last time. So depending upon how long this talk goes, I may answer them with a little bit more brevity than I might you know, traditionally respond, but I will provide answers. Okay, so the, the statement from the books of Joshua goes, now we go further back to fill a conspicuous gap. Age is hearsay, says the sage. When we think we came to be is elemental mythology. One day, Joshua asked a friend, does philosophy have a patron saint to help secure its end? On November 25th of a misplaced year, she called from Huntsville to reveal St. Catherine as the keeper of the seal, the learned Catherine of the elevated wheel, whose voice led Joan to her choice and her appeal. And so was Joshua born on the feast day of a tortured form, the feast day of philosophy in the shadow of a dragon tree. Now, before I tell you a little bit about the story, it turns out a few years ago, um, I was invited to a Christmas dinner. Um, it was a small gathering, about eight people. Um, it actually um, was at the house of the producer who um, was responsible for producing Phalaris's Bull, the play I did in New York. At some point after the dinner, the conversation turned to age, birthdays, and in I don't know, it went on for a little while, maybe 20 minutes or so. Um, and, and finally, since that passage addresses the issue of birthdays, uh, one day Josh about to, um, now we go further back to fill a conspicuous gap, age is hearsay, says the sage. That's specifically responding to the question of how do we know how old we are, you know, rigorously. Philosophy is always concerned with considerations of rigor. Right? Um, well, I recited that passage. And the funny thing was, it brought the conversation to an end. There was silence after that. And somebody remarked about the ability of that passage to silence the room. Now, for me, there was significance to that in a, in a slightly different direction. Um, whatever the reason for that silence on that occasion, it symbolized for me the role of philosophy in our, in our lives, in our, in our discussions, in our dialogues, that philosophy does not exist to stimulate discussion, stimulate conversation, encourage debate. It exists at the limit of rigor to end debate, end uncertainty, end discussion. Now, I know that sounds harsh, but that is convergent with the notion of, well, something that one hears in religious, the Western religious tradition, the silence of God. The idea that at the limit of understanding, there 
are no words and there need be no words. So philosophy is seeking in its exercise of a limiting rigor, an incontestable rigor, an incontrovertible set of propositions to end discussion, end uncertainty, end debate. Silence the room. Now, in terms of where that, where that passage, what the elements were that came together in that passage, philosophy operates independently of religious traditions, of mythologies, of faiths, of systems of belief. It is only an incontestable rigor. But one day, um, I was talking to a neighbor. Now, you'll notice in that passage, um, there's a reference to Huntsville. Huntsville is where NASA, it's one of the headquarters of NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, responsible for this nation's space program over the years. The woman who was, who's referenced as um, contacting me, reaching out from Huntsville, had been a neighbor of mine in Los Angeles. In fact, and she worked for NASA. She worked for NASA in Huntsville, and she worked for a division of NASA when she was living here, um, the division that was responsible for assembling the engines for the space shuttle program of some years ago. Well, one day I was just thinking to myself, um, everything in, in life has a patron saint from the perspective of the Catholic tradition and, and I think the Eastern Orthodox tradition, you know, figures that are capable of supporting us, of guiding us, of assisting us in you know, the travails, the difficulties, the challenges of life. So I thought to myself, well, there must be a patron saint, or I would think there might be a patron saint of philosophy. I wonder who that would be. And I happened to be having a conversation with her shortly after those ideas were running through my mind. So I happened to mention that to this friend of mine. Well, maybe it, it might have been a few weeks later that she's driving to work and listening to a public radio station in her car, a station that provides you know, discussions on serious topics and information. Um, information, I guess I'm, I don't listen to that station very often, but apparently about major events of the day. Um, and she happened to be listening on November 25th, the date of my birthday, and she heard on that morning broadcast, the patron saint of philosophy identified as St. Catherine of Alexandria with a feast day of November 25th. Now, it turns out November 25th is not universal um, for the celebration of her day. Um, in certain denominations of um, of the Christian tradition, especially certain denominations of the Eastern Orthodox Church. I think it's November 24th, but predominantly it's the 25th. And there is an image of her, a stained glass um, representation of St. Catherine. As I said, she's represented abundantly in the history of art. And I'll talk about it in more detail later. Um, Especially, I'm going to talk about some of the iconography. If you'll note now, she's wearing a crown. Um, she has a palm leaf in her hand. She has a sword, actually, in her other hand. Um, and somewhere, I think maybe ringing her is a representation of a wheel. Um, wheel. Now, in that paragraph from um, Books of Joshua, I mentioned the figure of the elevated wheel. One of the things that's profoundly important about the tradition of St. Catherine is she was tortured to death. She was tortured to death at the age of 18 or 19 on what's called the wheel that has now been called St. Catherine's wheel. 
I don't want to get into details of torture you know, in these talks, you know, if you're interested in, and, and it turns out I've read different accounts of exactly what was involved in the case of St. Catherine. Um, and again, these things took place, um, well, actually St. Catherine lived at the end of the third century, beginning of the fourth century AD. So these things took place almost two millennia ago, which means there's, there's a lot that is debatable about the actual circumstances of, of her life you know, and, and her death. But the wheel, the torture device is significant here because as I emphasized a great deal in these talks, philosophy as the great religious traditions aims to address the worst of human experience, the worst that human beings can be confronted with and that have to deal with. You know, we can take a, an aspirin, you know, to deal with a headache, but if we're facing some horrific circumstance that's tantamount to being tortured to death, well, we need something stronger. We need something that can rise to the occasion of that extremity of suffering. So it's a, it's a testament to the, the Christian tradition that it begins with a man being tortured and that its symbol is the cross, a torture device, that Christianity does not skirt the issue. In the case of the other great, the, the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition is one of really the great, one of, one of the most important of all religious lineages, traditions in human history. The other is really the Buddhist. There obviously are many sort of forms of religious faith, of belief in different cultures. Um, but in terms of the two predominant traditions, we can point to Judeo-Christian Islamic and its theistic orientation, belief in a singular God, um, and the Buddhist tradition and many of the cultures it's influenced. In, in some of those influences, it's had convergences with oh, Taoism, you know, of China. Um, and it has had a profound effect on many of the indigenous traditions, religious traditions of cultures in Asia that it has come in contact with. But the Buddhist and the Judeo-Christian Islamic are really central, you know, to human religious experience. So I tend to emphasize those two major traditions when making comments about the relationship of religion to philosophy. Of course, more generally, one can simply say, when we are talking philosophically, we're talking about rigor. We're not talking about any mode of belief or faith, um, any approximation to certainty. And that can distinguish a set of beliefs from what philosophy is embracing, articulating, and guiding us in the direction of. Okay, so let me just check on something. Um, okay. Let me tell you some actual details as they are understood, um, as they are agreed upon more or less about St. Catherine. As I mentioned, she lived at the end of the third century, beginning of the fourth century. She was the daughter of a ruling figure, governor um, of Alexandria. Alexandria is one of the great cities of the ancient world. It was established, founded by Alexander the Great. Um, that's a significant point of convergence. Remember, I, I, I said that we were going to talk about some convergences that um, pertain here. Um, that's one of them. Alexander the Great was taught by Aristotle. That's one of the extraordinary convergences in the history of culture, of civilization, that one of the greatest of all philosophers was the teacher, the tutor of one of the greatest of all military leaders and conquerors and founders 
you know, of, of cities, of, of organizers, of, of cultures. So St. Catherine emerged from the culture of Alexandria. It was a highly intellectual culture, you know, of that time. Um, the library of Alexandria was represented the greatest collection of books of manuscripts in the world. The, the culture of that city was influenced by, by Greek thought, philosophical thought, um, often Platonic thought um, that took the form of what's called Neoplatonism. Um, without going into the details of that, maybe at another time we'll talk a little bit more about like, Plato and his importance, the importance of his thought in the history of philosophy and culture. Um, one way to summarize it is um, the goal of Neoplatonism, the philosophy that was in the air, you know, of that culture. Um, the goal of that philosophical vision was to achieve mystical union with God. Now, I like to be able to summarize things, you know, in aphoristic form, you know, highly concentrated. Um, when I say, when I explain to people what philosophy is, I, I, I simply say philosophy is rigor, the limit of rigor. And what is rigor? Rigor is difference. We exist in difference from everything else. That is our fundamental dignity. Um, that is ultimately what achieves the equivalent of religious salvation, but rigorously. Well, when we hear the that philosophical formulation of the Neoplatonists, mystical union with God, well, really, we want to know in more concrete terms, in more in, in terms that we can address um, more knowingly what mystical is, what union is exactly in the context of God, and what exactly the concept of God really means here, if we can articulate it or or, or give it some explication. For example, when, when we talk about materialistic versus spiritualistic, the material versus the spiritual, um, I give it concrete form in an aphorism. The material is the past projected onto the future. The spiritual is the future projected into the past. So I'm sort of translating kind of vague terms into something that, from my perspective, is more concrete, more graspable. Well, so St. Catherine grew up in that kind of world, that kind of culture. And in fact, there was, in the century following her, her life, a famous woman philosopher, Hypatia, who was a Neoplatonist and did hold that type of belief. And in fact, there are some scholars that think that St. Catherine, or the, the legend of St. Catherine is really part of the legend of Hypatia, that this figure, St. Catherine, is an amalgam you know, of a variety of different individuals, but the most important contributor is Hypatia, um, a Neoplatonist philosopher, but that's not what the majority of scholars historically have embraced. And in any case, Hypatia came a century later, and there's no reason not to think that there could have, couldn't have been two figures, you know, two women with philosophical sensibilities um, that have, but went in, in a different direction. St. Catherine, um, as the daughter of this governor of Alexandria, was sometimes described as a princess. Supposedly, she was beautiful. Um, in particular, she was apparently highly educated and smart. Well, at some point, around the age of 14, she experienced a religious conversion, had what people sometimes describe in the literature as visions, you know, visions of, of Jesus, visions of Mary, the Virgin Mary. And 
based on those visions, based on that experience, converted to Christianity, embraced the Christian tradition. Now, this was around the year 300 or so. One thing to, to note is that at that time, Alexandria, Egypt, was part of the Roman Empire, part of the Roman world. Christianity had originated 300 years earlier, but was still a, a cult, not the official state religion. It was not officially embraced until Constantine, Constantine the Great, about 12 years later in the year 312 or so, on the eve of a battle. Talk a little bit about that. So at the moment, the Roman Empire is not embracing Christianity officially as it would with Constantine over a decade later. The emperor that arose, um, that was in control of that part of the empire, there were divisions within the empire, it actually was going through a form of civil war at that time. But the emperor that was in charge of, of Egypt, where Alexandria and where um, St. Catherine lived, it's called Maxentius. Maxentius took power around 305, 306, and began imposing restrictions and and began persecuting Christians, okay? He was opposed to the inroads of the Christian faith. St. Catherine at this point had embraced Christianity. And so she went to the emperor, apparently she had access, you know, she was a princess or at least, you know, the daughter of a prominent figure, you know, within that part of the world supposedly approached Maxentius and pleaded for him, argued, you know, for him to stop the persecutions, you know, stop his cruel treatment of Christians. Maxentius um, did not embrace, you know, her petition, her, her arguments, her efforts. Instead, what he did was to assemble, again, this is as the tradition tells us, and I find there seems to be general agreement on some form of this part of the story, he assembled a large group of philosophers, non-Christian philosophers, pagan philosophers at the time, as you know, they were subsequently referred to, about 50 of them, and brought them to St. Catherine, or brought Catherine to them, um, and the idea was for the philosophers through their force of argument and persuasion to convince St. Catherine, Catherine, that Christianity was not the, you know, the truth to embrace. Instead, the opposite happened. And again, according to the historical legend, um, St. Catherine, Catherine, defeated, you know, all of these philosophers in argument. She ended up converting the majority of them to the Christian faith um, rather than the opposite. Well, this is that prop that encounter is probably central to what allowed Catherine to emerge as the patron saint of philosophy, that specific part of her legend. Maxentius was not happy with that outcome and he put her in prison. And he began to torture her, not on the wheel, that comes later, but in some way he tortured her in prison, trying to get her to repent of her beliefs, you know, and, and, and renounce them didn't work. Um, not only did it not work, but apparently um, Catherine su succeeded in converting Maxentius's wife to Christianity. So this made the situation 
that much worse. Um, apparently there were some hundreds of people that supposedly she was responsible for converting to the faith. Um, so this was obviously driving Exentius crazy. Um, well, since torture was not achieving his goal, what he did next was propose marriage to her. She was beautiful, um, again, supposedly, um, but Catherine's response was to reject the overture, reject the proposal, because she claimed she, had, she was married to Jesus, married to Christ as a, an emblem and as an embodiment of her faith. That notion of her marriage to, to Christ and her having remained a virgin you know, in that marriage is something celebrated in the Western artistic tradition, um, in paintings um, that are often entitled The Mystic Marriage of St. Catherine. I'll show a few of those a little bit later. But so Maxentius's overtures were rejected, and now he decides that he will torture her to death. And that's what he proceeds to do on the wheel. Again, details vary in terms of exactly what that involved. Um, but supposedly this wheel, this spiked wheel, um, broke when the torture was, was being undertaken. Um, and in frustration, finally, um, St. Catherine, Catherine was beheaded. And that ended her life. Um, and began her story. Um, it wasn't though until, and then soon after that, Maxentius met Constantine on the field of battle um, in a civil war for control of the empire, the Roman empire. Um, the fateful battle um, is called the Battle of the Milvian Bridge took place in 312 AD. And on the eve of that battle, and again, historical accounts vary as to the details, but Constantine had a vision. There was a revelation. He saw, you know, something in the sky, a sign. And, and it basically led him to embrace Christianity, the Christian faith on the eve of battle. He saw it as a harbinger, a sign that God, Christ, was supporting his efforts, was supporting his goal of defeating Maxentius and becoming the supreme ruler of the empire. And that's in fact what happened. Um, Constantine was victorious and, and he attributed his success to that vision, that sign he received. And so when he became emperor, and he, he's called often Constantine the Great, you know, one of the most important emperors in the history of Christianity, and in the history of the Roman Empire, and obviously in the history of Christianity because he embraced Christianity as emperor. And that is possibly the single most important event in the growth of Christianity and its eventual domination as a religious faith of the Western world. So, but it happened about six years after the torture and death of Catherine. Now, Catherine's stature um, took time to develop, time to, to, to grow. Um, a couple of hundred years later, about 250 years later, Justinian, one of, one of the other great emperors you know, of the later Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire in particular, because at this point it had split you know, like in the middle 500s, established a monastery to St. Catherine. And I'm going to show you an image of that monastery. I don't think I sent this to Aaliyah. Um, this is at the foot, apparently, of Mount Sinai, 
and let me there you can kind of see it at the base of the mountain it's the monastery of saint catherine it is one of the i think it's the oldest like still operating monastery in the christian world or, or one of it also has a library that is the longest continuous running library in existence so it has stature as well, um, just as St. Catherine does. Um, I mentioned that um, Catherine is one of the 14 holy helpers, one of the 14 most important saints in the Western tradition, in the Catholic tradition, um, and that she's one of the six most important figures in the East. Um, in the East, she's also called one of the great martyrs. You know, someone from the early tradition who suffered you know, for her faith, um, but held to it. Now, clearly for, for our purposes, the most important aspect of the story is the embrace you know, of philosophy and the fact that this figure, this figure who is tortured, tortured at a young age, this female figure. That's an important part of this, of this story. Um, philosophy, especially in the West, is known for its male exemplars. Like if one goes down a list of the great philosophers, it's typically men that one's listing. You know, Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, Locke, Hume, Kierkegaard, Wittgenstein, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, these are, these are men. But the patron saint of the tradition within the Christian world, the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox world is a woman and a young woman. Um, turns out, not surprisingly, that among, in addition to being the patron saint of philosophers, she is the patron saint of many other categories. Again, within different traditions, uh, different denominations, it varies. Um, she's in some, in some traditions, the patron saint of young girls, the patron saint of unmarried girls, the patron saint unmarried women, the patron saint of um, people at the moment of death. I mean, there's a lot that, you know, a lot of roles that patron saints are typically assigned, but probably most prominent historically has been a relationship to philosophy. Now, in terms of the convergence of her feast day and my birthday, well, one thing of the major philosophers in the Western tradition or the major philosophers one can, can look up, um, no one had a birthday on November 25th. So that's that was of interest to me. Now, one, one question, is that a coincidence? And, and that, of course, begs the question of the nature of coincidence. Um, from a philosophical standpoint, the standpoint of rigor, how would we decide? How would we know that something is, in fact, a coincidence rather than something that has what we might say, deeper significance. Well, there's a, there's a film that um, came out uh, maybe 10 years ago called The Counselor. Um, it's based on a novel by uh, a prominent writer, um, Carmack McCarthy. It's, it's about drug dealing, um, but, and, and it's about a drug deal that goes bad, very bad. Um, and at one point, one of the characters talking about how the, the, the head of this cartel, this organization um, whose um, drugs have been lost um, is go are going to react. Um, you know, one of the characters in defense as well, it's, it may, might just be a coincidence what happened. And, um, and the, um, the other character responds, speaking of these, drug lords, um, they've heard of coincidences. They've just never seen one. 
Well, the point is that from the standpoint of rigor, philosophical rigor, to establish that something is a coincidence and not something deeper, you would have to be able to go back in time and change something about the precipitating circumstances, the circumstances that led to that outcome and see if there is a different outcome. And what do we know about the nature of existence? We can't do that. We can't do that in principle. We can't do that ever under any set of circumstances, but it turns out that just that kind of operation, just that kind of experiment would be necessary to establish even the concept of fate, the concept of predetermination, um, the concept of destiny. You would have to be able to go back in time, change something and see either no matter what change you make, you get the same outcome, then the outcome was faded, then it was destined. Or you go back, change something, and get a different outcome, then it wasn't faded. But we can't ever do that for anything. We can't ever do that for any scientific experiment. We can't do that adequately to establish causation. We often hear when discussions of experiments in, in, in medicine, in biology, that um, certain, certain results, certain studies establish, are observational. They establish correlation, but not causation, as if one could ever do to a level of rigor that can satisfy the demands of a rigorous assessment, an experiment that could establish causation. To do that, we'd have to be able to go back in time and change something. And even if we did that, the time, this going back in time provides a difference between the original set of circumstances that could account for a, a differential effect. So causation can't be established, um, nor can fate, the notion of fate, be established, nor can it. Those concepts exist within heuristic space where things are approximately the same. And so we can sort of approximately do the experiment, approximately make the comparisons. But again, approximations help us build whatever devices, whatever objects, whatever tools, um, whatever technologies we're interested in developing, all of those results, every product that we manufacture is manufactured within certain tolerances. The difference between those processes within heuristic space that are goal-directed and what philosophy seeks is philosophy entertains no tolerances. Things are precise at the limit of rigor when we are assessing a result, a situation philosophically, rigorously. Okay, Let's see if I addressed what I wanted to about that background. Yes, it looks like it did. Okay, now I mentioned just to show you now one of the reasons I'm dwelling upon the life of St. Catherine is to show you that the patron saint of philosophers is not a minor figure within the Catholic or the Greek Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox tradition. She's a major presence. It suggests again, you know, what I'm arguing for um, every week, the preeminence of philosophy um, in, well, historically, um, as in the background of, of technological results. Remember, it's, it was philosophers that created science, the scientific methodology. It's philosophy that can critique the scientific methodology and can improve it. It was Einstein that used philosophy, used basically the philosophical orientation of existentialism, that we cannot leave the world to view it from the outside to develop really this theory of relativity. And that is also central to the work of Heisenberg in developing 
quantum mechanics. Both of those scientific results, those monumental scientific results are the result of the application of a fundamental philosophical orientation, a fundamental philosophical rigorous demand. If you cannot leave the world and view it from the outside to develop or articulate or elaborate your science, well, don't pretend that you can. Your results are stronger when you abide by the demands of rigor, which are the demands of your circumstance. So it's, it's significant that the patron saint of philosophers is one of the most important figures within the entire Christian religious tradition. In terms of her representations in art, I mentioned there are features that one sees, and there are two general traditions of painting her. And I sent Aaliyah some of these, but I'm going to show you some of these images as well. Um, so one tradition is of St. Catherine alone. And when she's depicted, um, it's typically with a palm leaf. A palm leaf, we saw that that was in green in the stained glass window representation. The palm leaf represents victory victory over her philosophical opponents, victory over her suffering, victory in her life, victory over Maxentius, right? the general triumph of her life that her faith represented and, and was a key to. The crown you see on her head is um, signifies her royal or quasi-royal status. You know, she was a prominent citizen of Alexandria, um, the daughter of, of a governor, as again, often referred to as a princess. Um, she has a sword in one hand. That sword represents the sword that was used in the beheading that ended her life when the wheel broke. And the wheel is usually represented in every one of her depictions. Um, I think that might be ringing her, um, ringing her head in this instance. Often it's on the ground, often it's on her side. Um, I'll show you some other um, representations. Um, we have here, let me show you this, um, another early representation actually of her, of her, of her death is what that is. Um, of her being beheaded. Um, this is hard to see. Here is a depiction, actually a sculptural work of the wheel, a spiked wheel. And the wheel has a crack in it that represents supposedly the cracking of the wheel as a divine intervention thwarted the efforts of Maxentius to torture her. Some other images now. Here's what I wanted to like focus upon. She was painted by many of the leading figures, you know, of the Western world. There you see um, a sculptural representation of the wheel, um, cracked, not because it was an artifact that was damaged historically, but that signifies again divine intervention um, in preventing her torture. Um, in terms of other representations, there is a work by, of her, St. Catherine, by Raphael, the great Renaissance painter. Raphael painted her. Here's a representation, but there's the Raphael. There's a representation I wanted to show you, I think maybe Aaliyah has this also, by Titian, another of the great Renaissance masters. Um, she was also painted by Titian, um, a Venetian painter, a master of color, um, and again, one of the most important artists in the entire Western tradition, St. Catherine. Um, he, she was also painted by Veronese, another one of the great Venetian masters. 
The point is that she is central to the Western painting tradition. She is painted by the masters of that tradition, signifying her significance for the entire Christian faith. That's the Veronese. And then, possibly the greatest of all paintings of her was done by one of the great masters, um, a little bit, he lived a little bit later, Caravaggio. And in the Caravaggio painting, you see Catherine next to her wheel, next to St. Catherine's wheel. Hmm. Now, I also wanted to just show you, and these I don't think Aaliyah has, um, there's a whole other tradition. There's the Caravaggio, um, probably the masterpiece, you know, of the St. Catherine depictions. Now, in addition to these singular images of St. Catherine with, again, um, wheel being a predominant image, a predominant um, artifact that's represented. And even in the case you can see, it's a broken wheel that's consistent with the legend. We also have a long series of representations of the marriage, the mystic marriage of Catherine to Christ, to Jesus. That was the reason why she declined Maxentius's offer of marriage and is part of her, her legend, part of why she's celebrated. She again is a virgin saint and part of her representation usually has a ring on her wedding finger. Um, that again signifies her mystic marriage to Christ. Um, here, here's one image um, that is by a, another Renaissance master, Parmigianano. Actually, he's a mannerist painter. He comes a little bit after the high Renaissance, a little bit after Michelangelo. And um, just to show you from a slightly different tradition, the French master of the 17th century, Poussin, painted again a marriage scene, St. Catherine in her mystic wedding ceremony with Christ. Okay? So fundamental in, in the Western tradition, in depictions, because again, of her status, her stature. Um, and that also signifies something of the historical stature, significance of philosophy. Hmm? Now, one of the things that we'll be talking about a little bit later is, is Harry Potter and how, you know, that's not how philosophy is, philosophy is not seen with quite that stature um, everywhere, universally, even though um, it still retains it in many important places within our culture. Okay, I have, um, I've mentioned the gender significance of St. Catherine, the gender significance of St. Catherine intellectually, that this is a woman, a young woman, who is associated with what's considered the, historically, throughout much of history, the highest of all intellectual endeavors, philosophy. So in terms of providing inspiration for women, over the centuries for girls in their education because she was also a patron saint of, of girls and married women, providing a source of inspiration, you know, for, you know, for women generally, we have, again, a, a woman who is the figurehead of this profound intellectual tradition that philosophy represents. Okay, now I want to say a little bit about the encounter with the pagan philosophers. We don't know exactly what form that took. 
you know, we don't know what, you know, what was the source of, um, of Catherine's argumentative ability. We don't know, um, you know, what types of arguments, you know, she presented, you know, how she supposedly defeated these philosophers. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that Socrates was not among them. Socrates had been dead about 600 years at that point. Um, the, an encounter with Socrates probably would not have had that kind of outcome. But remember, Socrates himself was condemned to death because his philosophical orientation was seen to be undermining the confidence, the faith in Roman, in, in not Roman, in Greek gods, in Greek mythology. He was seen as corrupting the youth, causing them to challenge the nature of, of their belief in, in the Greek religious, religious system. And we know how Socrates was able to do that. For Socrates, what mattered was what we could justifiably know, right? That's, in, in my work, takes the form of what we can incontrovertibly know, what we can know at the limit, at the highest level of the exercise of rigor. So basically Socrates was in the interest, was in the business of undermining belief, systems of belief, because they were not grounded in a higher, a deeper, a firmer rigor. Now, we obviously, Socrates wasn't using that terminology, but when Socrates, at, you know, after, after his trial, um, as reported in Plato's Apology, Plato's first major work, which features Socrates, all of Plato's dialogues feature Socrates, though increasingly they, you know, the, the character of Socrates voices Plato's philosophical views, not those of Socrates. But early on, it's more Socrates that we're hearing. Well, remember, as after he's been sentenced to death by the Athenian court, and as he's saying farewell to his friends, he says, and so we go our separate ways, you to live and I to die, and which is better, only God knows. And that's the nature of a philosophical embrace, a philosophical response, a philosophical solution. If you are suffering, if you are in anguish, it is because you are assuming things, you are presuming things, you are believing things that you cannot incontrovertibly establish. And rigor demands such degree of such such strength of establishment. If you can't establish those beliefs, then don't entertain them at your peril because they are supporting your suffering. And the, the form in which I give that Socratic orientation is an aphorism that I've, I've said before and will continue to say because it summarizes a great deal of that part of the Socratic tradition, the Western philosophical tradition originating with Socrates, and that is we suffer, not because what we know and not because what we do not know and not because what we cannot know, but because what we think we know unjustifiably. Okay, So that response to Catherine's faith-based representations is formidable. And so basically confronted with that type of rigor, if she had been, you know, my contention throughout all of these talks is that rigor is the strongest instrument that human beings possess, that the incontrovertible solves the world. The incontrovertible you know, is at a higher level of rigor than any of our other activities and represents the firmest guiding principle in our thought.
when we are suffering, it's because we are embracing something that does not rise to those standards. We are suffering our beliefs, not the certainty of our circumstance. So again, my contention is that the power of philosophy at the limit of rigor is greater than you know, any system of belief and can explain how those systems of belief achieve their results at their, their highest embodiment, but at the same time can also give you an alternative to belief that is stronger. I, um, I have an aphorism. The Bible is not the word of God. The word of God is stronger. In, this, in that rigor is stronger than any system of belief. It frees us from belief and beliefs of various kinds ultimately ground our suffering. If one, one can say, and this is one of the points that I've been making um, in one form or another, I talk about heuristic versus epistemic space. Epistemic space is philosophic space, rigorous space, divergent space, the space defined by difference. We exist in difference from everything else. Heuristic space is convergent space. Um, if you are suffering, if you are in despair, if you are in pain of any kind, and this relates to some things we were talking about last week with Joshua, the ability of one's ideas to have an influence over one's actual experience of physical pain, which is, again, not intrinsically surprising because thoughts are electrochemical phenomena, drugs that might be taken to help reduce our pain, you know, in interrupt or, or alter electrochemical phenomena. Um, it's not, they're not fundamentally different, actually. But if you are in any kind of pain or anguish or suffering, the philosophical view is that you are in heuristic space. You suffer within that space. You suffer your assumptions, presumptions, beliefs, faiths that do not rise to the level of rigor. Rigor frees us. Okay. Now, I wanted to let's see, we're we doing okay. Yes, we're doing okay with time. I wanted to end my discussion of St. Catherine with another little section, little paragraph from the books of Joshua that summarizes some of what we talked about. Um, oh, the one thing I haven't yet mentioned, actually, that is in what I'm going to recite, is that one of the most important influences that Catherine had upon the subsequent. Western culture, Western tradition was through her influence on Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc heard voices as a young girl, um, voices that directed her to help lead the French against the British, the English, um, in, in the Hundred Years' War. Those voices Joan of Arc attributed to St. Margaret and St. Catherine. So that's an important sort of theme that I go back to um, in my writings and in terms of, again, some of the convergences that we see with Catherine. Um, she's linked to Alexandria. She's linked to the philosophical tradition of Alexandria. She's linked through Alexandria to Aristotle in a way. Um, she's linked to Joan of Arc, another you know, great female figure, inspirational female figure. I mean, if you need to address questions of the capacity of women in any role in society, in culture, look to Joan of Arc. Okay, um, so the passages that I wanted to conclude on the talk on St. Catherine go, Spirits do not boast, but pay witness to the host. They parse the terror and the horror, not the dolor or the farce, and seek to release a brodequin bone and draperies of flesh from a sparrow's home, elevated and alone.
And Catherine sends her legions forth to embolden Joan on her journey north towards a trembling star. And her only trace is the wind on your face, blowing from afar. Now, in that passage, it starts out, spirits do not boast, but pay witness to the host. They parse the terror and the horror. That's in a way, relates to, can be thought of as a paraphrase of, something by Emerson, the philosopher, the American philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson of the early 19th century that I've quoted before. Great nations, great spirits are not boasters or buffoons, but perceivers of the terror of life. And again, it's from that terror and to formulate a response to that terror, that Philosophy finds a lot of its motivation. That was part of the theme of last week's talk on the books of Joshua. My work began in nightmares. And again, it's what stimulates the great religious traditions to find answers you know, to the horror of circumstance. The Draperies of flesh from the sparrow's home, elevated and alone, is a reference to the wheel. In one account of the wheel, it's elevated on a, the, the victim is tied to the wheel, and the wheel is elevated on a post, like a short telephone pole, um, and, and sparrows will then pick at the, the body. Again, I don't want to go into the details, um, and there are different accounts of what this torture was like, but that's, and then brodequins is actually another torture. Um, it's a French word. Um, again, I'm not gonna go into the details, but let me just say that um, it was a torture so horrific that the torturers themselves refused to perform it. So, and again, um, I mentioned torture only because Philosophy and the great religious traditions exist at their most powerful to address it convincingly, effectively. If they can't do that, then they're not worth the investment of our, our time, our energy, our, our intellectual focus, and our spiritual orientation. Now, let me see. Okay. Um, okay. Now, before I get to the questions, um, I want to spend a little time, it's not going to take too much time, on um, Harry Potter, um, and then a little bit on the Gettysburg Address. Um, Harry Potter comes up, as I said, because um, this November is the 20th anniversary of the first movie um, to be released in the Harry Potter series. Um, I've mentioned before, I will mention again, that the title of that movie and of the first Harry Potter novel throughout the world was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. That was the title everywhere except the United States, where the title for the movie and the book was changed to Sorcerer's Stone, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And the reason for that was um, the marketers felt that people in the United States didn't have enough background in philosophy, sense of philosophy, embrace of philosophy to make that a compelling title. The rest of the world apparently was seen as having that embrace, that appreciation. It's one of the reasons why, you know, I do philosophy publicly now, why I talk about philosophy to explain to people, you know, the power of it. And, and it's why, for example, I as often don't use the word philosophy, just use the word rigor, because within the United States, rigor is embraced as the highest standard of intellectual justification. You know, a result is rigorous or it's not worth taking seriously. Well, the true rigor, the limit of rigor, the, the embrace of rigor is philosophy. That's all philosophy is, the exercise of rigor at its limit. 
at its most powerful. And, and again, that's not a view that I find is, is appreciated, even by professors of philosophy. That is a view of philosophy that has come as a distillation of my philosophical work over many years now. But when I present that to professors of philosophy, they find it compelling. So um, the hope is that as time goes by, there'll be a greater embrace you know, of philosophy as rigor, because it's not a system of belief. It's not your viewpoint. It's something that transcends viewpoint. Um, now, Harry Potter deals with magic, right? The sorcerer is a, is a magician. Um, a philosopher is not a magician, but a philosopher's stone is the focus of that title and that book. So the question is, what are we talking about? What exactly is a philosopher's stone? Well, um, it, it has different meanings over the centuries. Um, basically, a philosopher's stone is a transformative device, a device that can transform, well, in one of its applications, um, in alchemy can transform base metals, lead, into gold, you know, the most valuable of metals. So it has the power of transformation. Now, alchemy, alchemical transformation, is something that was a preoccupation throughout many centuries of human inquiry into, into nature, into natural processes. Um, we think of Newton as the great figure you know, at the dawn of modern physics, really the scientific revolution. Newton's Principia Mathematica is considered the Mona Lisa of science. But Newton actually didn't spend the majority of his time doing science, doing mathematics. He spent the majority of his time doing alchemy. He had an alchemical laboratory in his study and devoted his time to alchemical experiments in the effort to effectively engage the philosopher's stone, discover the philosopher's stone, or discover its essential secret of transformation. Now, the notion of transformation is central to human effort broadly on, on almost every level. The notion that there's something fundamentally awry, the Buddhist notion, something fundamentally awry with the human condition. The, the Judeo-Christian Islamic notion that humanity fell from the Garden of Eden, a state of grace, and has to recover it because, again, in our present circumstances, removed from the garden, things are not satisfactory. So there's the sense of needing a transformation a transformative event, a transformative change. When we're engaging in technologies and creative kinds of activities, the idea is to bring together convergently a series of elements, whatever those elements might be for the process that we're exploring and achieve a different result, a new result, something that can do things that the individual parts could not something that is transformative in the outcome. In, in the case of art, we are taking paint, color, line, whatever the, the elements you know, of the medium that we might be using. And, and if we're doing a portrait, we are conjoining those elements to achieve something that what, is representative of a different reality. We, we take paint, we take pigment, and, and through proper ordering, a careful ordering, we get the sense of a human face, a human personality. That's a transform, again, a transformative event, transforming one thing into something else. Well, that's what the Philosopher's Stone is meant to do in, in its deepest or most spiritual application. It's helping achieve a complete solution to the problems of human life. And in that regard, we would see the Philosopher's Stone as the exercise of rigor in, in 
my discussion of it. And let me see, do we? Okay, I still have a little bit of time. Okay, um, so for a lot, now the reason that I bring up Harry Potter is not just the 20th anniversary, but again, since central to it is the philosopher's stone, this power of transformation, power of solution to human problems, the ultimate power of solution to human problems in my representation of what philosophy, what rigor um, can achieve, well, we see the activity of, if we are of a, of a Catholic or of an Eastern Orthodox persuasion, the activity of the patron saint of philosophy. We see the hand of St. Catherine. And, oh, and I just wanted to show you quickly um, the posters. I don't know if you're going to be able to read this, but, well... There's a poster of Harry Potter, and there's a subtitle. You can see it um, right there. In, in the version that I was just showing, it says the Philosopher's Stone. In the United States, we saw this version, where in the same place, it says Sorcerer's Stone. Okay, you can see it there. Philosopher's Stone, and then it's changed to Sorcerer's Stone, okay? Um, but again, so far as we're talking about philosophy and a Philosopher's Stone, we see the hand of the patron saint of philosophers, metaphorically. And finally, this is also, November is also the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. Um, the Gettysburg Address is considered one of the most succinct and profound statements of American political philosophy, the philosophy that supports the American experiment. So once again, we see the hand of philosophy and of the patron saint of philosophy. Now, Lincoln was not a philosopher, but he was schooled in Shakespeare. He was schooled in the King James Bible. Um, his language has an, a concentration and an authority that has communicated these distilled representations of a democratic vision throughout the decades. The Gettysburg Address was delivered in 1863. It was delivered in November to commemorate the Battle of Gettysburg, which had been fought at the beginning of July 1863. It was considered the turning point of the war. Um, it was a Union victory, a Northern victory, and from that point on, the South, this, um, the Confederate forces, um, never penetrated into Northern territory, and that moment represented the turn of the war um, in the favor of the North and against the South. The, um, the loss of life was horrific, something in the order of 50,000 soldiers. And so a, a cemetery was dedicated um, to the fallen. And a ceremony was arranged. Um, there was a prominent orator of the time, Edward Everett, who was the featured speaker. He spoke for two hours. His address is largely forgotten. Um, he had a lot of classical references. Um, um, in his speech. Abraham Lincoln was asked last minute to give a few appropriate remarks, and he delivered about 270 words. There are slightly different, there are five different handwritten versions um, that Lincoln prepared. So the word count varies slightly from version to version. Um, 270 words, it took maybe two minutes to deliver, um, and it contains classic statements of American political theory. Um, and it comes down to, just to show you here, um, it comes down to just a couple of lines. Every line in the speech is famous. Um, but um, four score and seven years ago, our fathers, founding fathers of the country, brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, of course, these days we wouldn't say men, we would say all people, all human beings. Um, and obviously the sense of who 
enjoyed the full equality under the law has has been expanding, right? But we're talking about a what a heuristic vision. We're talking about a society that is bound together by a sense of people being more or less equal for certain purposes, right? That's the definition of a heuristic space. Within the space, objects are approximately equal, approximately the same for some purpose. And the purpose in this case is societal stability, the same under the law. And and in the conclusion of the Gettysburg Address, we have one of the famous statements of democratic governance. That the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. That's again a generalized vision. It's the idea that it's not a king, not a singular authority, that is commanding the law and commanding the forms of society. It is the agreement among the collective members of the society. And that agreement represents, again, what a convergent function. And what is convergence? Convergence is the governing dynamic of heuristic space. A society as a collectivity, as a group, um, is a heuristic structure in which elements are brought together convergently. That's the fundamental democratic vision, that the individuals are equal approximately, approximately so, under the law, um, equal for the purpose of ultimately societal stability, for decision-making within the society, and that experiment, that philosophic experiment, continues to this day. Okay, so that's the talk. Um, now, I know I ran a little bit long. Um, I, I thought I might, and there were a lot of questions, so I think I will address those questions, as I said, with some succinctness, some brevity, um, but I will get to the essence, I think, of the questions. Um, that is the hope. Okay, so Christian Buddhism, and shall we add here Shintoism and Japanese samurai religion? What do you think of that? Um, okay, um, obviously there are many religious traditions, you know, within the world. Um, there are Native American religious traditions, and you know, traditions among indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples throughout the world. Um, Shintoism is actually the indigenous religious set of religious beliefs and practices of, of Japan. It's a, it's, a, it's a polytheistic type tradition, an animistic tradition. Um, um, natural forms um, are infused with spirits, you know, in the way that in the um, Greco-Roman tradition, there are gods within natural forces, natural processes. So it has a connection to that. Um, the samurai is a later tradition that actually was heavily infused with Buddhist sensibility, Zen sensibility. Um, but, and even Shinto has had a little bit of influence on, on the part of Buddhism. Um, but really when I've was talking earlier about the two, the great religious traditions, we see really the, the, the imprint of the Judeo-Christian Islamic in terms of monotheism and the Buddhist in terms of really a divergent solution, you know, a deconceptualization um, of, of experience that allows us to undermine concepts, concepts of disease, old age, and death. But I see I still maintain that it's those two main traditions that in terms of or helping to illustrate the distinction between philosophy and religion. That's one of the reasons why I, I, I reference those traditions generally and their ambition in terms of addressing the great issues, challenges of human life. Um, 
Yes, Buddhism and have you ever recognized that in Buddhism and Shintoism, philosophy and religion go hand in hand? Yes. The you know the distinction between philosophy and religion um, varies um, in the accounts that different philosophers would give. What I mentioned um, earlier in this talk about Neoplatonism seeing um, philosophy as uh, the, the goal of philosophy is achieving mystical union with God. That's not what my vision of philosophy, what contemporary philosophy would say is philosophy. I, you know, I subscribe again more to the Socratic tradition where we're interested in achieving a, an incontrovertible, rigorous representation. That's more metaphorical. So, yes, you know, when the, the, the boundaries between the two um, are not definitive, boundaries between any two concepts are not, um, are not actually rigid. Um, that's something that is central to Wittgenstein's results. But um, again, if, if it's a matter of belief, it's not philosophy. If it's a matter of rigor grounded in distinction, indifference, then it is. Um, let's see. My question is only how a digital world impacts a state language of any country. Does it mean we need to understand and adopt to it? Um, yeah, there's, I mean, currently, you know, technology, there's been interest in universality of communication, universality of language throughout the centuries. Um, in the Middle Ages, it was Latin that was the universal language. Um, there is an advantage to having such a language. Um, when and, and there are sacrifices, obviously. It's, as you move towards that universality of a form of communication, you lose some of the you know, distinctive features of a native, a local tongue. It's a sacrifice. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that Kierkegaard was Danish. He lamented the fact that he was Danish and that he had to write philosophy in a language that was spoken by so few people. And so it took a very long time for Kierkegaard's work to disseminate, to reach a larger audience who had to be translated. Um, so yes, there is, you know, there is a loss, there is a price to pay for that universality of communication, but like any, any sort of choice we make, there are advantages in the end to that, making that choice. Uh, let's see, a few words about Martin Luther. In the end, um, in the case, um, it became a 30 year war, 30 year war. Okay, we're talking about the 30 years war that um, Martin Luther's work helped spawn. That was a war between um, Protestant um, Christianity in the West and the Catholic tradition. You never know, you know, where things are going to lead. You never know what the alternative would have been had Martin Luther not, you know, advanced his, his doctrines, his theses. Um, his alternative, you know, form of Christianity. It might have been worse. You can never do the experiment. Um, I know I'm, I'm being very brief with this. Um, what philosophy gives us in our daily tough life? Um, philosophy gives you eternal hope in the sense that if you were in despair, it's what I've said before, if you were in despair, if you were in pain, if you were suffering, it's because you are in heuristic space. You are making assumptions claims, presumptions about the world, about your circumstances that are supporting your suffering, that philosophy has the power to undercut. And, and philosophy maintains the past cannot guarantee the future, the future decides the past. So no matter what, what your circumstances, you cannot justify despair, cannot justify hopelessness. And I know I'm rushing, but finally, now the last question I can answer very quickly because the question is, if you know about Jack Fresco, what do you think of his philosophy? I do not know about Jack Fresco. Um, I presume he's a, a, a contemporary philosopher. I haven't looked him up. I tend to try to stay away from commenting on contemporary philosophers just because I often find myself in disagreement. That's true, you know, if any you know, people you know, working in a given field at a given time. And I don't want to diminish because I happen to disagree with the work of someone else. So I have, I have, but I have not heard of him. So um, if 
in a subsequent question, you want to sort of convey to me some, some particular view of his that you'd like me to comment on, I would you know, happily be able to do that. But, um, but I, as again, you know, mo we, we see this historically. Um, I, I just don't want to be saying, I, I often disagree you know, with other philosophers and I'd rather not be disagreeing with a living philosopher who might take offense. Okay. That, I think, concludes tonight's talk. I know it went a little bit long, but... And I want to thank people. I noticed there were some birthday wishes. I want to thank everybody for those, those, those sentiments. I appreciate them very much. Um, and, um, and I return them to you in spirit whenever it's your occasion, your birthday. I, I, I recognize how important it is to honor, you know, such a day. So thank you so much. It's very much appreciated. See us one more time. Stephen, happy birthday. And yes, we do have a lot of feedback. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, Karina. Kazina, thank you very much for your wishes. And then right here, we do have comments. Yeah. Thank you, Narai. Happy birthday. Um, wish you good luck. Thank you very much, Naraya. We see everything. Then, Kazina, my congratulations to Stephen. Thank you very much, Kazina. And then here we have Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Wow. Welcome. Hi, Happy Daniel. Birthday. Yes. Be healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, these wishes are all appreciated, all very deeply appreciated. I thank you so much. See us one more time. Thank you very much, Stephen, for being with us weekly. We're really glad to have our philosophical talks on a regular basis. One more time, happy birthday. Hope you have a great day. Happy Thanksgiving. And one more time, big thanks to the U.S. Consulate General, American Space Almighty, and also you, the audience, for being with us. Here we do have questions. I will definitely address them to Stephen, so we'll answer them next week. Please make sure to join. Stay safe and have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you again so much for your best wishes. And thank you so much, Aaliyah.